It is called, it's called Hell Week. And it's called Hell Week for a good reason. It is an exceptionally grueling process. Some say the most grueling process in any military in all the world. It is a grueling process that seeks to weed out the weak, and not always physically weak, because there's more to strength than just your physical body, but the weakness in the head and the weakness in, in the heart, and the lack of will and resolve to move forward in spite of great obstacles. And so it's called Hell Week, and they seek to weed out all of the recruits who aspire to become Navy SEALs. And I might add, don't fall for any of Chris Bauer's stories. <laughs> but it starts, and they don't put this on a calendar, and they don't text you when it's beginning. But it starts sometime on a Sunday night. More than often than not, they're asleep and they're on their cots and their beds, and all of a sudden there are explosions and the sound of machine gun fire arguing over your head, and the hardest week of your life begins. And so in the course of that week, which then ends sometime on Friday, but nobody tells you when it ends on Friday, in that week, those young men pouring out of that tent, and those tents, and actually I should say those that actually make it to Friday, they will travel 200 miles. They will travel 200 miles, not by car, but by running, by swimming, by paddling, sometimes literally by crawling, sometimes literally by rolling. Their bodies, pretty much for the whole week, skirt the edge of hypothermia. And all of this is done from Sunday to Friday on a grand total of about, maybe if you're lucky, three hours of sleep. And you thought you had a hard week. On Wednesday, Typically, the class visits the Tijuana mudflats down by the Mexican border. It is mud, which is the consistency of quicksand. It is thick, and anyone who has ever written about their training and their experiences will tell you it is very, very cold. Running and crawling and laying out, laying together arm in arm, a brotherhood of suffering. And then the night comes. And the wind almost always picks up coming off the sea. And the instructors, this is kind of cruel, stand by the fire off to the side, warming themselves. And they say to the recruits, they say, hot coffee, homemade chicken noodle soup for anybody who wants it. All you have to do is quit. All you have to do is give up. And in fact, they say, if, I can get, if we can get five people to quit, just five of you to quit, to ring the bell, to give up this foolish dream that you have, will let the entire group come out of the mud. And we'll let you do something else for fun. <laughs> One day, there was this young man shivering. And finally, he couldn't take it anymore, and he stood up. And he starts walking to the fire. His friend tries to stop him, but he won't have anything to do with it. He is on his way to the fire because I bet you when you've only slept about an hour and it's Wednesday already, and hot coffee and hot coffee and chicken noodle soup is like an apple in the Garden of Eden. And he walks and he's almost there. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there is a voice that rises out of the darkness. It's a voice and it's singing. It's a stubborn voice, it's a, a defiant voice. And from what I have read, it is not the kind of song that anyone would sing in church. It's not even baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> not for sensitive ears, I have read many, many times. And so, all of a sudden, another voice starts singing and joins in, <coughs> and still another, and then still another, and then the young man stops. And he turns slowly. He walks back to that brotherhood of suffering. Lays down in mud. 
joins arms with his colleagues. And they sing and they sing and they make it through the night together. Admiral William McRaven, who tells that story, who knows a few things about that training, says this in his book, if you want to change the world, if you want to change the world, he said, then you should start singing when you're up to your neck in the mud. And those are great words, and his book has a lot of great words in them. But centuries before, there was a couple of people in Israel, I think, might have actually figured that out. Just open up to the book of Luke, John the Baptist's mother and father, Zechariah and Elizabeth each take a turn belting out a tune of just sheer amazement, giving thanks for God's grace. And of course, everybody knows about the angels who come to serenade the shepherds. And then at the end, there's an old guy by the name of Simeon who is stooped by age and whose eyes have grown cloudy by life. And even he, at the end, gets a little bit of a solo. And of course, the centerpiece of all the singing, the centerpiece was the one and the only Mary, the mother of our Lord. <clears throat> In Greek, Theotokos, which means God-bearer, who said, sings one, as we are reminded this morning, sings one for the ages. It struck me this week, all these years, <clears throat> I've been reading these texts, and it suddenly dawns on me, and maybe you too, that Andrew Lloyd Webber has absolutely nothing on St. Luke. And Mary and those around her and all of their ancestors know all too well what it means to shiver and what it means to be mired neck deep in the muck of life. It is to a, a small nation of no standing in the world's eyes, to a poor, powerless, penniless young woman that God in His grace comes because that's how God works. Mary is no heavenly being, but make no doubt that she is incredibly special because she has been blessed and from her comes the one who will fulfill the meaning of that song and shape the foundations of the world. The one that then as now that not everyone, not everyone greets with joy to the world. The very essence of the song that Mary sings, and this is a, a theme that appears in the Bible again and again and again, is a theme of inversion. Turning the world upside down before God sets it right side up. A terrible song, a terrible song, meaning a fearful song and a, a frightening song because God is not fair. God takes sides. God takes the side of those beaten down. God takes the side of those who have been run over. And the presence of Mary's little one is a sure sign that God finds it all, frankly, nauseating and intolerable. And because her son lives beyond death's suff suffocating grasp, we can still sing, and we still sing, and we will sing until that day he comes again. And the foundation shivers and shakes, and the oppressors fall, and it never stops, and it will never stop until, until God sets the world right. Some 1900 years after Mary sang, about a thousand people gathered by candlelight around a place called St. Nikolai in East Germany. I had never heard of St. Nikolai, and I bet you haven't either, but you may have heard of the organist they had that years ago. I think his name was Bach. Imagine replacing him. <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, they gathered and they started singing. And literally within weeks, within weeks, there were 300,000 people singing. Three times the size of a U of M football game. Don't take, tell any of those U of M folk that I said that. 300,000 people singing, stubborn and defiant and faithful and hopeful. And once again, the powerful fell from their thrones. The wall crumbled. Well, sometime later, a curious man asked a, a former member of the Stasi, which was the secret police in East Germany, why didn't you, why didn't you crush us? You've done it so many times before. And the 
former policeman just paused a moment. He kind of, kind of shrugged his shoulders. He said, you know, we, we had no plans, no contingency plans for people singing. Amen. <laughs>